looks like we're live. So uh, thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. I have uh, uh, Palig Halar Hadar and uh, Tomer Barr, who are going to be here to be talking about their uh, uh, research into the uh, Stuxnet uh, printing uh, vulnerabilities that they found are still uh, still around after you know ten years later. Uh, but uh, to start things off, we have uh, two first-time speakers, and as our tradition in DEF CON, we, uh, we shot the noobs, and so uh, I'd like to uh, uh, invite you all to join me in a shot, folks. Here's to uh, your talk. Thank you. Cheers. All right, great. So we actually have a, uh, a first question on the line. It said, can you please explain more? about the fuzzing process when finding corruption in the SH, SHD files. Yeah, sure. So actually, it was pretty interesting because we didn't want to use um, some, I don't know, uh, uh, already existing tool. We wanted to do something on our own. So after we understood uh, the SHD processing, uh, processing uh, uh, the, the SAG processing and all of this stuff, we just wanted to, to do the most naive thing. We just written our own Python script, which takes uh, already uh, uh, already existing SHD file, which works. And we just mutated it one by one, uh, one byte at a time. And we used uh, zero to FF on each byte. And we didn't do anything that uh, was uh, you know, dependent by uh, uh, each byte, we just did it uh, each byte uh, at a time. Uh, afterwards, we just dropped all of the SHD files and we wanted to make sure it's working and we understood that there's some kind of a limit uh, in the service that it won't process more than uh, 256 files at a time. So we just uh, modified the Explorer service, we just patch it and we replaced the check with NOPS, of course, and then we just uh, kicked our own uh, kind of a spoiler, which was modified, and it, it just worked. Uh, then it took 20 minutes, it processed all of the SHD files, and it crashed. So it was pretty cool. Uh, we, we don't uh, intend to release the Python script, but uh, maybe we will. We, we need to discuss it. Very cool. Yeah, I was... Uh, um... I was pretty impressed with the uh, the ability uh, or uh, or what you guys did in sort of walking through the entire, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, kill chain of the uh, of the Stuxnet. Um, I mean, how much of the uh, how, how much of studying that original code uh, do you think influenced your your discovery of this these uh, remaining uh, these remaining vulnerabilities? Yeah, I think it was pretty much uh, because uh, when we start when we started to look at it. We thought that, okay, it's 10 years after Stuxnet. Uh, a lot of very strong researchers already researched it. What are the chances that uh, we will find uh, anything new? But we came with a lot of motivation. And after uh, seeing that the first patch was, was not fully patched and can be re-exploited, and the second patch and the third patch, so we understood that uh, we are onto something. and. Other the research, and after 20 minutes of fuzzing, you get your first uh, crash. Uh, it's not usual, and uh, that gave us uh, uh, hope that uh, we'll find uh, uh, more. And yeah, it's happened. Great. We have another question from the uh, from the audience. It said, "Was the SHD crash exploitable?" So, good question. Uh, from what we we have seen, it wasn't exploitable was only one byte which was uh, controllable and uh, uh, it was pretty odd. I mean, uh, we're pretty sure it, it wasn't exploitable, but we really invite everyone to, to try and maybe to understand whether it's exploitable or not. And if it did, if it's uh, exploitable, so tweet about it and you can mention me. And I'll be with me. It's, it will be very interesting because as we mentioned, uh, Microsoft uh, didn't fix it. So uh, it might be more interesting and in, uh, Maybe if you'll find something, you can report it to Microsoft as well. So uh, good luck. Actually, we see a lot of people, a lot of researchers that uh, haven't been in the spooler. Uh, and now we see a lot of research about the spooler. So we hope uh, we'll contribute to that. Definitely. 
So I see another question. Yeah. So the uh, uh, the other vols were there were they found by fuzzing or code review? So uh, actually, good question. So uh, after we started fuzzing and we had our first crash, we were uh, intrigued enough in order to to move to uh, manual source code auditing and manual binary auditing. So it was found completely manually, 100%. And uh, we just looked at the code and we understood how the mechanism works and what kind of use cases we can, you know, challenge the mechanism and we just found it manually. Where it was pretty cool. Basically, we're, uh, we, I know uh, I do, I think Tomer as well, we, we use less fuzzing. We generally do more uh, manual call auditing. Uh, but I think uh, you know you can find interesting bugs uh, using uh, fuzzing and using manual code auditing. Uh, if you use both, it will be probably the best. Yeah. So you mentioned the uh, uh, Microsoft's decision not to uh, not to patch that SHD one. Did you, I mean, do you think that they were justified in in uh, uh, in their logic on that, or or uh, would you have liked to see them patch it? Well, I think that they have a very clear uh, uh, security boundary and uh, service criteria on MSRC. Uh, I don't want to say uh, whether I think it's right or not. But all I can say is that they, they mentioned that uh, local denial of service uh, is not, uh, uh, you know, it's not past their service criteria, and therefore it won't be fixed. Maybe they will decide to fix it uh, if it will be used in order to abuse or something, but. Uh, I respect their decision. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. And maybe other vendors, uh, endpoint vendors, will release signatures for that. So maybe the antivirus or other security control can uh, manage to uh, prevent this. Uh... So you mentioned the. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I have a question. So when I was watching the video, I noticed that when it came to the last path vulnerability, you kind of gave a very pregnant, there you know, no vulnerability yet. And is that more because you guys are expecting one to come out or have a theory that there's one out that just hasn't been released in the wild? Like, there was a big emphasis on that. <laughs> uh, we don't have anything uh, up in our sleeves and we don't know about anything. And of course, if we, if we will know, we will report it to Microsoft. But uh, all we said is, you know, you have uh, two paths which were uh, exploited and you have a uh, the third one, which uh, might be exploited and might not. We don't know about anything that uh, you know, uh, we know as much as you know. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Maybe we will uh, find that Microsoft uh, has patched it uh, in the future. But nothing concrete. All right, so uh, we actually have another question uh, on the line. It said, after your experience on this, what would you say to researchers attempting to re replicate the same vulnerabilities on uh, Siemens microcontrollers matching those in Iran? So, Tomer, do you want to take it? Um, Siri, can you repeat the questions? So, uh, if you didn't understand. Yeah, it said, uh, so, after your. After your experience, uh, what would you say to researchers attempting to uh, replicate the same vulnerabilities on Siemen microcontrollers matching those in Iran? Well, actually, this is uh, not the focus of our research, so we are not expert on that. <laughs> I think that uh, our research is basically focused on the propagation part of uh, Stuxnet and the Spuro service uh, specifically. And the Spuro service is on the Windows uh, Microsoft code, so it's not related to the, you know, uh, to the hardware or anything else. Just any uh, default Windows OS hardware. Uh, yeah, definitely. So you... I think uh, it's a huge, uh, you know, it's a huge domain, Stuxnet, and we have so many aspects to to look. We focus on the the Windows part, and. We don't know if uh, the fact that we found a vulnerability in the same uh, domain in, in the Windows part will, uh, you know, uh, just said that if you will do the same in the Siemens PLC, it will be the same. But I think it is a, a 
uh, interesting part that uh, if you want to, to get into, just share it with the community. I think it will be interesting enough to people to, to come and see. So maybe we'll see you in that one next week, answering this question. <laughs> yeah, something tells me if they actually have, anyone has an O day up their sleeve for uh, Siemens microcontrollers, they're probably not presenting that at DEF CON, but uh, yeah. we'll see. <laughs> probably. Right, so um, uh, mm -hmm. you, you talked about the, uh, the, the spooler, or you demonstrated how the spooler was exploited uh, by a local user um, to get the escalation. Um, it, it seemed like you, you were hinting that this might still be a remote capability as well. Did you, did you find that or not? No, actually, we were only focused on the local, uh, local good escalation uh, path vector. And we haven't found a way to bypass the patch, the original patch, uh, to get a remote code execution. Great. So it looks like we got another question coming in. Um, but uh, let's see, uh, we're all waiting for typing to be done. But um, so um, you know, earlier you talked about. Uh, walking through the the stuckNet uh, uh, process and sort of finding um, finding which which vulnerability still existed um, it, so your original intent was to recreate that and look for residual or was it to actually to look at uh, you know what um, what vulnerabilities that by themselves may be still available so we had uh, the first question was if we if but building Stuxnet 2.0 is possible, of course, allegedly. And when we start to look at uh, the components, and we saw that uh, if uh, for, for our, our luck, the community luck, uh, the discovery, the, the uh, say equivalent uh, vulnerabilities that were found in the last decade uh, to allegedly build the Stuxnet 2.0 were disclosed to Microsoft in a safe manner. And, but if uh, evil corp that will uh, manage to do it uh, by themselves, a single uh, actor, and uh, it allegedly can build uh, equivalent capabilities or propagation capabilities of Saxon. So we asked ourselves, okay, what else is missing? And the only missing part was the printer spool of vulnerability. So we thought it would be a very interesting uh, research, and it was. Uh, so we started to dig in and uh, found uh, three vulnerabilities there. Next question we have in chat is, what do you think about the state of variant analysis in the Windows platform? What, what do you mean by variant analysis? So we'll have a follow-up there and they'll yeah. get back to us. Um, all right, so the next one was, uh, were there any unused methods found by you in the Stuxnet code, uh, revealing any possible planned future attacks? No, actually, we haven't. So, uh, yeah, we, we didn't mean. Uh, I mean, we, we didn't look on Stuxnet code, or uh, you know, we just uh, we, were, we were focused on the vulnerabilities which were used by Stuxnet. We didn't, and, and the propagation part, we didn't uh, dive into Stuxnet code. So. Clarification on that last question. Um, when it comes to variant analysis, they were speaking to like analysis existing vulnerabilities to find variants. I don't know. Okay. Uh, I think uh, if I got it correctly, I think that the state is, I mean, it's very interesting because I know that uh, once someone finds a pretty common bug class, uh, a lot of other researchers uh, are diving into it and find a lot. I mean, uh, if you if you can take a look of uh, MSRC each month, uh, obviously releasing a bulletin of Patch Tuesday, and uh, I think that the very common uh, vulnerability backlash is of course the elevation of privilege, which is uh, caused by uh, logic bugs. And I think that you can see a lot, and I think that the trend got started. I don't know if of officially, but at least what I know is James Forshaw uh, just uh, you know. Take a look, uh, took a look of all of the file system privilege uh, uh, issues and, and released a lot of tools uh, that uh, helped other researchers to take a look of it. And then people just uh, found a lot of variants. Uh, 
So, so I think that uh, it's definitely a pretty discussed uh, topic. And uh, I know that I will keep in, and take a look if the backlog still exists, if that answered your question. Yeah, and if I may add, uh, that's why we uh, started to develop uh, our driver, mitigation driver, that is not focused on a specific variant. It looks at the root cause of the entire uh, arbitrary class uh, like progress. Uh, so uh, I believe that uh, if there will be a uh, future uh, exploit in this uh, backlash and this driver, which is also only a POC, if someone will take it and make it more uh, product ready, uh, production ready, so uh, may uh, catch some and take some new uh, future experts. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think it will be interesting to see if any vendor uh, adopting the, the, the idea, yeah. implement it in, uh, in his own uh, product. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the driver. I was uh, I was pretty impressed with the uh, you know your your uh, publication of that uh, and the analysis of those uh, those universal right you know locations. Um, uh, I mean, it seems like uh, that's something that could be fixed in policy as well. Do you see you know what what do you see the advantage of using the driver approach you did over a uh, just an ACL and a policy or something? I mean we. We, it, it can be fixed by policy, you're right. Uh, I mean, we wanted to demonstrate the, the solution. Uh, it's not like we are um, uh, saying that it's you know 100% uh, sealed and there are no vulnerabilities that can bypass it. But we do think it was a pretty good uh, way to demonstrate it. I think that the use of a, a mini filter driver uh, is good because obviously you you catch the IRPs and the IO requests uh, pretty low and can just block it and cancel it. Uh, I don't know uh, what kind of uh, you know whitelisting uh, uh, or you know uh, policy you, you will use. Obviously, the vendor can just implement it by using his own mini kernel driver, mini filter driver. But I think it's a pretty good uh, uh, demonstration. Right. So we talked about this a little before the call started. Uh, um, I think the most uh, uh, comical thing I saw in your presentation was that uh, you all man managed somehow to get the uh, uh, the leak tag on your CVE. Um, was that something that you actually uh, uh, actually timed, or was it uh, just a happy coincidence that uh, Microsoft uh, labeled you guys leak with their CVE 2021-337? It wasn't happy coincidence. It was the happiest coincidence. <laughs> I mean, uh, we didn't <laughs> we didn't organize anything. We didn't ask for it. Uh, we just got it. Uh, Thank you for uh, Nate uh, Warfield from MSRC. Uh, we signed it. Uh, it's an awesome uh, CV number, and I think uh, everyone uh, wanted to get it. So uh, <laughs> maybe next year, uh, one more time. I don't know. <laughs> I think I have the, all the big what if questions, so I'm just going to throw this one out even after the other one. You know, in your talk, you focused a bit about how the last patch, the previous patch, had kind of killed the concept of remote execution, and all of these were focused on local. With these new releases that you've just done, or the POC releases, what do you think that there's a chance that these can kind of pivot into remote execution now? It's not likely, um, but uh, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, I, I warned you guys against one one year or it answers, but uh, we'll we'll let you slide on that one. So, I feel like I just put a very pregnant question out there. It's like, come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're uh, uh, we're pretty happy to have you guys. Uh, I think this is uh, this is pretty uh, pretty interesting. I think there was a really I really appreciated the uh, the the sort of uh, complete walkthrough of the of what you know what the uh, uh, what the malware did and and uh you know what ex exploited each way, each step and uh i think like you said it this may have been uh, or there should have been something that was covered you know pretty extensively over the last 10 years but uh um you know going back and revisiting those uh can can have happy coincidences as well right yeah definitely 
Uh, I think that I would be glad to, to see another, uh, you know, uh, briefing and walkthrough in a decade. Uh, so uh, <laughs> if will someone will remember, uh, it will be probably still, uh, you know, interesting to see. The next time on Vegas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're coming up on uh, only 10 minutes left. Do you guys have any, uh, any last words you'd like to share about uh, the research? I, I shared your, uh, your GitHub out there, and I understand that uh, uh, you've kind of got one more uh, uh, release up your sleeves waiting for you know, Patch Tuesday next week. Um, uh, do you want to give us a yeah. preview of what we may see then? Yeah, so actually we gave it a preview during our uh, talk. We had a, a video which demonstrated the demo of how we bypassed the patch of 20, uh, CB 2020-1048 and how we re-exploited it. Obviously, we can provide the details now, but we will have to wait in the, the last moment uh, and we, when the patch will be released. We hope it will be on uh, the, the following patch Tuesday. That's what MSRC told us, but we can't guarantee it, of course, because we're, we're not Microsoft. So we have to see, to wait and see. Uh, and once we will be able to, to make sure that it was already patched, we will release the POC in the GitHub repository that you published on uh, the channel, and we will also uh, provide a write-up, uh, technical uh, blog post. So uh, wait and see. We will mention it on Twitter as well once it will be deployed. And uh, you know the last thing I wanted to say, Tomer, if you want to add something, uh, so uh, go ahead. But. I think that uh, it was very interesting uh, uh, research, and we provided all of our uh, technical materials in, in our uh, uh, GitHub repository. And if anyone would like to, you know, to continue research uh, the same area or something, if you have any questions, go ahead. You can DM me on Twitter. You can, uh, you know, you can mention me, and uh, we'll be glad, Tomer and I, to to help someone to to keep. Uh, I think we there are a lot of. Uh, other areas which are related, not even on this on the this floor itself, but even in this floor itself, it's a huge mechanism, and there are a lot of things to keep and investigate it. And we didn't have uh, much time, so uh, if anyone would like to to do it and we would like some help, go ahead. Yeah, totally agree. Okay. Um, well, so I'd really like to thank you guys for uh, for the talk you guys did. I want to congratulate you again on. Your first time at DEF CON, and uh, if uh, dropping two O days uh, for uh, DEF CON is, is uh, what we can see in the future from you guys, I'm sure we'll be uh, inviting you back next year. So thank, thank you all. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. It was fun, and we are stopping to work on it. Stay tuned.